and join me in prayer. Lord, either through me or in spite of me, may your word be heard. And upon hearing, may we be moved to act according to the will and love and grace of your Son, who is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. If you're at all like me, your eyes were glued to the TV screen this past Wednesday, much as they were four years ago, from former President Trump's farewell address to the inauguration of our 46th President, Joe Biden, along with the first ever woman, first ever African American, and first ever Asian American Vice President Kamala Harris. The day began with speakers blaring YMCA and My Way as Air Force One headed to Mar-a-Lago. Then came stirring renditions of This Land is Your Land and America by Jennifer Lopez, along with Amazing Grace by Garth Brooks, an awesome performance that left myself and many of my clergy colleagues comically scratching our heads as he encouraged everyone to sing along in the last verse, only to repeat the first. One of the notable moments included Lady Gaga delivering an impassioned presentation of the national anthem, complete with a golden microphone to match the unmissable, massive golden brooch of a dove carrying an olive branch on her chest. Despite my immediate thoughts conjuring images of Katniss Everdeen declaring herself as an alternate tribute from District 12, it turns out this particular fashion choice apparently was not an allusion to the Hunger Games. Instead, Lady Gaga took to Twitter to explain her statement to the world, writing, a dove carrying an olive branch. May we all make peace with each other. She went on to write, Singing our national anthem for the American people is my honor. I will sing during a ceremony, a transition, a moment of change between POTUS 45 and 46. For me, this has great meaning. My intention is to acknowledge our past, be healing for our present, and passionate for a future where we work together lovingly. I will sing to the hearts of all people who live on this land, concluding, I pray tomorrow will be a day of peace for all Americans, a day of love, not hatred, a day of acceptance, not fear, a day for dreaming of our future joy as a country, a dream that is nonviolent, a dream that provides safety for our souls. A transition, a moment of change, peace, love, acceptance. These are all words that reasonably and appropriately come to mind when gazing on the image of a dove with an olive branch. However, to Christians, regardless of how we felt this past Wednesday, that particular symbol takes on an even greater meaning. Anyone familiar with the great stories of the Bible would most likely, perhaps immediately, recall the story of the great flood in Genesis, when after 40 days and 40 nights of rain, Noah sent a dove from his ark in search of land. We read, after 40 days... Noah opened the window of the ark that he had made. He sent out a raven, and it flew back and forth until the waters over the entire earth had dried up. Then he sent out a dove to see if the waters and all the fertile land had subsided. But the dove found no place to set its foot. It returned to him in the ark since waters still covered the entire earth. Noah stretched out his hand, took it, and brought it back into the ark. He waited seven more days and sent the dove out from the ark again. The dove came back to him in the evening, grasping a torn olive leaf in its beak. Then Noah knew that the waters were subsiding from the earth. He waited seven more days and sent out the dove, but it didn't come back to him again. In Noah's 600 
first year. On the first day of the first month, the waters dried up from the earth. Noah removed the ark's hatch and saw that the surface of the fertile land had dried up. In the second month, on the 27th day, the earth was dry. This ancient story of flood waters receding, chaos and destruction being replaced by restoration and new life, along with a rainbow of promise and protection, has long associated the image of the dove and olive branch with peace for all those familiar. Meanwhile, the Gospels tell the story of God's Holy Spirit descending on Jesus Christ in the form of a dove at the baptism of our Lord. We read in Luke's account, when everyone was being baptized, Jesus also was baptized. While he was praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit came down on him in bodily form like a dove. And there was a voice from heaven, You are my Son, whom I dearly love, and you I find happiness. Today, along with Christians throughout the world, the church celebrates this high holy day known as the baptism of our Lord, where we reflect upon this story about a humble son of a carpenter baptized by his cousin John in the Jordan River 2,000 years ago, and also remember our own baptisms and the meaning of this sacrament on our lives. Sacrament, theologically meaning an outward and visible demonstration of an inward and invisible grace, or in layman's terms, something we do that Jesus did to remind ourselves that God loves us. In considering our baptismal covenant, we are once again reminded of the image of the dove and the Holy Spirit. As part of our traditional baptismal liturgy, Found in the pages of the United Methodist Hymnal and Book of Worship, we read, Almighty God, when nothing existed but chaos, you swept across the dark waters and brought forth light. In the days of Noah, you saved those on the ark through water. After the flood, you set in the clouds a rainbow. When you saw your people as slaves in Egypt, you led them to freedom through the sea. Their children you brought through the Jordan to the land which you promised. A transition, a moment of change, peace, love, acceptance. There is a reason these words can describe a dove with an olive branch as much as there is a reason they can describe the meaning of baptism. There is a reason That dove was present at Christ's baptism as well. And that only serves to deepen the conversation and make the sacrament of baptism in Christ and into Christ's church that much more meaningful to each and every one of us. Take our scripture from this morning. For example, here we find Paul, the great evangelist and apostle of Jesus, responsible for more than half of the entire New Testament on his third and final missionary journey through Asia Minor. After several notable stops, he makes his way to the city of Ephesus, a prominent Roman harbor port where he had established a small church during his previous missionary journey. Immediately, he seeks out Priscilla, whom he had left as leader of the local church, along with her husband, Aquia. Now, to be clear, you heard me correctly, Paul named Priscilla a woman as the leader of one of his original churches. I'm not making this up. It's right here in the Bible. Hashtag women pastors. When Paul finds this woman pastor, he is introduced to a small group of around 12 confirmation students. 
Luke uses the word disciples, but in reality, these were adult believers who had very little knowledge of what it meant to follow Christ other than attending church and claiming Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. Perhaps you've met Christians like this in your own life. In an effort to further their proselytization, Paul launches into a quick round of question and answer. And as our author Luke describes, he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? And they replied, no, we've not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And then he said, into what then were you baptized? And they answered, into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him. That is, in Jesus. Does it seem like Paul was nitpicking just a bit? Maybe. Maybe. I mean, sure, of course. But for those of us who are familiar with Paul, we know this was pretty tame discourse in comparison to other things he said and did throughout the Bible. On the other hand, was the distinction Paul was making of significant importance? Absolutely and undeniably. Here's the thing, as I mentioned earlier, Jesus was baptized by John about 25 years prior to this incident. Now, John's baptism had a very specific purpose. Again, Luke describes it this way. In the 15th year of the rule of the emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor over Judea and Herod was ruler over Galilee, his brother Philip was ruler over Ituria and Trachonitis, and Lysanias was ruler over Abilene during the high priesthood of Anas and Caiaphas. God's word came to, came to John, son of Zechariah in the wilderness. John went throughout the region of the Jordan River, calling for people to be baptized, to show that they were changing their hearts and lives and wanted God to forgive their sins. John's baptism was about two specific things. First, changing hearts and lives. We have a word for that in our Christian religion. It's called repentance. To be clear, repentance doesn't mean saying sorry or even feeling sorry, as many might believe. Repentance legitimately translates into the act of turning back. It's how we stop walking away from God with our words and with our actions, and instead align our path, our hearts and our minds with God's will. Repentance is a literal turn towards God. Second, John's baptism was about the forgiveness of sins, which is self-explanatory. God forgives. And by the waters of baptism... We are washed clean of the stain of sin. To be clear, these sentiments are true of Christian baptism to this very day. What Paul was telling these new believers in Ephesus in our scripture this morning is that this is only baptism 101. And once you add Christ in the mix, well, then you've moved into advanced level, 400 level baptism. As a matter of fact, John the baptizer said the exact same thing as Luke continues. The people were filled with expectation. Everyone wondered whether John might be the Christ. John replied to them, I baptize you with water, but the one who is more powerful than me is coming. I'm not worthy to loosen the strap of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. John's baptism was one of repentance and forgiveness. And so was Jesus' baptism. But Jesus' baptism offers one thing that John's baptism couldn't. That dove, the Holy Spirit, 
descending into our lives and into our hearts. This is why during every baptism in the United Methodist Church, the pastor speaks the words, the Holy Spirit work within you, that being born through water and the Spirit, you may be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Through baptism, you are incorporated by the Holy Spirit into God's new creation and made to share in Christ's royal priesthood. We are all one in Christ Jesus. With joy and thanksgiving, we welcome you as members of the family of Christ. The Greek theological word for this idea is ecclesia, which refers to two things. One, becoming part of the church, universal. And two, being incorporated into the physical and spiritual body of Christ, which extends across all national boundaries and reaches backwards and forwards in time through all generations. By the Holy Spirit alive in us, we become adopted children of God and a permanent fixture in the family of Christ, a truly holy family together, a distinction which can never be taken away and never replaced. The Apostle Paul writes it this way, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Meanwhile, John Wesley, the original purveyor of the United Methodist Christian faith, elaborates in his famous sermon, The Witness of the Spirit. The testimony of the Spirit is an inward impression on the soul, whereby the Spirit of God directly witnesses to my spirit that I am a child of God, that Jesus Christ hath loved me and given himself for me, that all my sins are blotted out, and I, even I, am reconciled to God. He continues, The Spirit of God does give a believer such a testimony of his adoption that while it is present to the soul, he can do, do more, he can no more doubt the reality of his sonship than he can doubt of the shining of the sun while he stands in the full blaze of his beams. Through baptism into the church through Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can be confident that we indeed have been forgiven our sins, that we have been reconciled with God, and that we are for all eternity adopted into the body of Christ. But there's one more thing. As John the baptizer proclaimed in the scripture we read earlier, and as Luke made clear in the description of the disciples at Pentecost, as Jesus himself proclaimed of the power that accompanies the Holy Spirit, to receive the Holy Spirit is to receive fire as well. And I don't mean a physical fire. I don't mean a fire that burns or harms or destroys. We're talking about that fire that gets lit in our heart, a passion that burns deep within our soul. Through baptism, we repent, we are forgiven, and then the Holy Spirit lights a fire beneath us that moves us to action, actively working for the will of God. And what does that action look like? Again, it can be found right here in our United Methodist hymnals in our baptismal vows. Do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness? Reject the evil powers of this world and repent of your sin? Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior? Put your whole trust in His grace and promise to serve Him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races. If acknowledging the witness of the Holy Spirit 
was advanced level baptism, then this is the postgraduate level. When the Holy Spirit lights a fire in our hearts so strong and so bright that we can't help but shine for all the world to see. And how do we do that? By resisting evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves. We already know that we are the children of God. This is how the world will know too. As we remember the baptism of our Lord today, may we all proudly wear our dove pins for all the world to see. Christ is love. Christ is peace. Christ is repentance. Christ is forgiveness. Christ is inclusion. Christ is acceptance. Christ is justice. Christ is transformation. Christ is restoration. And Christ is, was, and forever will be new life for all. Again and again and again. Amen.